All good. Brilliant. So we have um we have everybody here, yeah? All the participants are, are in? Yep. All good to go. Excellent. Okay, so it's three minutes past twelve, so we're a little bit late start, so apologies for that. Um, but I'll, I'll crack on. So good morning, everybody, and welcome to today's um, September meeting of the Innovation Network. So this is the first meeting of the network since um, the new innovation team began back in July. And before I go any further, I would like to take this opportunity to thank the previous innovation team. So we still have Vinny with us today um, for their brilliant work over the last two years. So they've handed over the innovation brief to us in a really excellent condition. And uh, we do look forward to, to stepping into their big boots now to, to continue on the journey. Um, so on that note, I'd like to introduce the new innovation team um, that have been seconded in um, across the public service. So I'm Jade, um, I'm seconded from the Residential Tenancies Board and I'm the Innovation Initiatives Manager. Um, so I also manage the network, so you will be hearing and seeing me a lot over the next um, couple of years. So we have Colin Flaherty, which is, who's on your screen there as well. Um, so Colin is the Innovation Team Project Lead and Colin has been seconded from and um, leash off the education training board. We have Owen also, who's on your screen too. Um, Owen joins us from the Gardaí, and he's our network and events executive. We also have Chris Kiernan from Chris Kiernan from the Defence Forces, who's our innovation fund manager. Um, we have Eilish Henry um, from the Pensions Authority, who is our HR and Learning and Development Initiatives Manager. And we've John Lawrence from Tusla, who's our communications manager. So we're working across the wider public service reform um, division. And some of us are on the innovation team who you'll be hearing and seeing from a lot more over the next um, couple of years. So on behalf of the team, I'd like to welcome you to today's session. Um, so I'm going to share a presentation just so we have something to focus on. So give me one second. You should be able to see this soon. So I hope everybody can see this. Now, is that on everyone's screen okay? Yep. Perfect. Sorry, technical issues. Apologies. Give me one second. So, can can you see my screen at the moment, or is there anything sharing for you? No, just yourself, Jade. Oh, just me. Okay. Um. Okay, I don't know what it was working all morning. I don't know why it's not working now. But anyway, I'll I'll crack on. It's it's only a picture that I was going to show you. Um so I guess today we're going to look at skills for successful innovation. Um and making innovation real is the strategy for developing and embedding innovation across the public sector. And that outlines the four key priorities to achieve this task. Um so today's session will focus on priority two. And if you could have seen my screen, you'd be able to, to see the priorities um in front of us, but I, I can share it afterwards. So priority two focuses on building um, a culture of innovation across the public service um, where staff and organizations are inspired, empowered and enabled to innovate. Um, and one of the goals identified to deliver on this priority is to equip the staff is to equip staff with skills and the mindset and tools to innovate. And um, so we hope the session today does just that um, and gets you thinking about how you can build an innovative mindset and what skills you need and the skills that you, do, you already have. Um, so you can find out more about the strategy on our website um, as well as the additional resources and the tools that we have um, to help you and your organizations develop your innovation strategy. So like I said, today's session will we'll focus on kind of the skills and the mindset of innovation. And we have four speakers um, today, so four innovators and experts in the area um, who will share their thoughts and experiences on innovation. Um, and specifically, they'll focus on the skills that they've acquired um, and used to innovate successfully and the skills that you might need in your organizations to do the same. Um, so we hope the session provides you uh, with an interesting insight into the skills for innovation and that there's some takeaways for you um, from the session today. So we have our four speakers who you can see on the screen in front of you. So we've got Fergal Brophy, who's an entrepreneurial and innovation specialist. And um, we have Grace Cunningham from Deloitte. And um, we have Julianne Coughlin, who's the service design manager in Port County Council. And then we have Mary Trace Power, who is the director of the project management office in the Department of Foreign Affairs. So each panelist will present for roughly 10 minutes. 
um, and then we'll have a question and answer session at the end. So just a bit of housekeeping before um, I go any further. I think everyone has their mics muted. And um, so we'd ask that you can keep them muted for the um, duration of the presentation. And um, you can ask questions and we'd love to get your questions throughout the session. So the chat function, um, you can send questions into the host through that and we'll ask them at the end. And then we are also recording this session. And um, so we'll share it on our website and through our social media channels after the event. And um, so on that note, I'm going to introduce you to Fergal Brophy. And um, so Fergal is an entrepreneurial and innovation specialist and teaches at the UCD Innovation Academy and the Institute of Public Administration. And um, Fergal also works with large corporate organizations and small to medium enterprises, as well as public bodies to develop new products, new services, new business models, new ways of working. And um, Fergal's also the lead innovation facilitator for the Enterprise Ireland Go Global for Growth Management Development Programme. Um, I've also had the pleasure of having Fergal as a lecturer and mentor on the Diploma in Public Sector Innovation course offered by the IPA. Um, and I know that he'll bring his passion, his energy, his enthusiasm to the presentation today. Um, so Fergal, thanks a lot for joining us and I'll hand over to you. I think you're on mute there, Fergal. <laughs> Hello. Yeah. There we go. Yeah, should be off mute there. Jade, thank you so much for that. And uh, I'm absolutely delighted to be here, guys, at the Innovation Network uh, gathering. Hugely uh, important. Um, I kind of, we spoke certainly a lot to Vinny at the outset when he was establishing the Innovation Network about some of the um, kind of best practices around the network. But I mean, really, you've done amazing work in getting this up and going. I'd like to pass on my huge Thanks to the outgoing innovation project team. I've worked with you all and um, I've loved working with you all and um, really enjoyed watching your enthusiasm for innovation in the public sector. And of course, a big warm welcome to the incoming innovation project team. I wish you all the very, very best in your endeavors over the, um, over the coming uh, months and years. So, Let's talk a little bit about um, the innovator. So there's been obviously a lot of research done on the brain and particularly around the, um, how the brain operates. And we know that it's not quite like it, we used to think it was. So much technology has helped us to understand the brain better. So it's not quite as clear now as a left brain and a right brain and that they're both almost distinct uh, elements. We know that the left brain does a lot of right brain activity and right brain does a lot of left brain activity. We know that we actually end up with a brain that is constantly changing to and adapting to its circumstances. So while this is a simplistic image, uh, I don't want to, I don't, I don't want you to think it's overly simplistic. I do understand. And I think we all understand the complexity of the brain, but it's interesting for us to just think about it in in a kind of dichotomous way. So on the left hand side, we have that left brain. You know, that left brain has been traditionally associated with logic um, with really concrete things uh, as opposed to the abstract things of the right hand brain. We can we know that data is its it's its it's its food. Uh, it loves data and processing and understanding data. Whereas the right side of the brain really loves the uh, the more intuitive and kind of gut feeling um, in life. We know that the left side of the brain is very focused on spoken and written words, whereas the right side of the brain is very focused on the visual and the storytelling. We know that numbers are very important to, to the left brain, whereas the uh, right brain is very focused on tones and spaces and stuff like that. And that's interesting for us to think about, you know, because essentially, the left brain is the part of the brain that thinks in the present. And essentially, the right side of the brain is the part that thinks in the past and the future. That's very, very interesting for me when it comes to innovation. Because things on the left hand side, like that are so important to problem solving. Analytical thinking, we need it. We need more and more data feeding into our decisions. Convergent thinking, this idea of, you know, at some stage we have enough ideas. Now, can we make some kind of decision about which idea is the best idea to proceed with? We need that type of decisiveness. 
you know, the fixed mindset and this cognitive bias um, uh, and, and, and this emphasis on quantitative research. Very, very important part of innovation. And then when we move on to the right side, you know, creative thinking, we need more of it. We know that the World Economic Forum has told us that in the future skills reports for the last 10 years, it's all been screaming out. We need more creative thinkers to solve the complex, ambiguous and unpredictable problems that we have in the world today. The right side is the part of the brain that we need to flex more to become more creative thinkers. And we need to be more divergent in many ways. When we, when we start to look at a problem, we need to be able to look at that problem and come up with lots of solutions early on. We know that quantity breeds quality when it comes to ideas. And then, of course, this idea of self-reflection, it's such an important component of an innovator. Reflection is important for us all, but it's particularly important for people who work in this very volatile, unpredictable, complex and ambiguous um, situations and contexts. And of course, we know that qual research is a very important, these insights, qualitative insights are very important drivers of innovation. So it's just interesting for us to think about the right and left hand side and to understand that people who are traditionally left sided thinkers can really flex their muscles, their creative muscles quite easily by engaging in creative exercises, be it sketching, be it, um, be it maybe even pick up a musical instrument, but even things like just thinking of ideas um, and working on ideas. OK, so that's just as a kind of outset, probably the most important piece of research ever undertaken to the innovator kind of inside the brain of the innovator is a book by the gods of innovation. Clayton Christensen, who unfortunately passed away last year, alongside Hal Gregerson and Jeff Dyer, wrote a book called The Innovator's DNA. It was the result of the most extensive piece of research ever undertaken into the mind of the innovator. They administered surveys to thousands of innovators. They got qualitative interviews with hundreds of innovators, and they actually tracked the lives for three years of 10 innovators. And they drew all this research together, and they ultimately ended up saying that the key differentiators between those people who are successful innovators and less successful innovators are five skills. And the skills are as follows. Questioning. The simple truth is, that successful innovators ask better questions than less successful innovators. So for you guys in the public sector, I want you to be thinking about those questions and being very, very focused on those questions. And I'm talking about all sorts of questions. The second key skill is observing, looking at things with fresh eyes and then experimenting, networking and associating. Let's look at them in each in turn. Questioning. We know as famous Einstein, the man of the century himself, he said, if I had an hour to solve a problem, I'd spend 55 minutes thinking about the problem and five minutes thinking about solutions. Essentially, he's saying I would question the problem. I would ask lots and lots of questions. And this is an area I find personally we're relatively poor at here in Ireland, is this idea of getting out and asking questions. I've just come out of a class in UCD and a lady said to me in the class, she said, I don't really like asking too many questions because I kind of feel I'm very invasive when I'm asking questions. And I say to them, well, look, at, you've got to ask the questions in order to be able to gather the insights. We know it's insights that drive innovation. So whatever way you do it, you're going to practice and learn how to ask better questions in a way that suits your personality. And the key kind of questions we're talking about, of course, are the whys, the why nots, and the what ifs. They're the most important questions in innovation. Of course, contextual questions like how, when, where, and how many are important. They set the context. But understanding, gathering those real insights, understanding the underlying reasons why people do what they do, 
we understand by asking the whys, the why nots, and the what ifs. So questions. The second key skill of an innovator is observing. Observing with fresh eyes. It was Proust, Marcel Proust, who said that the real voyage of discovery comes not in seeking new lands, but in seeing with new eyes. The simple truth is that successful innovators look at scenarios with fresh eyes. When they go for a walk in the park, they're looking at various problems that they see in front of them, and they're constantly trying to come up with solutions. And of course, we can practice this. This isn't that difficult. But what happens is we become habituated to, scenario, to situations, to the places where we work, the places where we um, spend our time, and we end up, you know, we go around with our headphones and with our dog and with all our other accessories, and we lose concentration, we're distracted, and we're not looking at situations with fresh eyes. So for me, we've got to practice more this idea of observing, um, and we've got to practice it with a view to becoming better. It was Margaret Mead, the famous sociologist, who said, how people, what people say they do and what people actually do are very often different things. That's why the focus of the questions is on what people say they do. The focus on the observing is watching actual behavior. And it's only when we combine questions and observation that we can gather real insights that help us. So that's the second key skill. The third key skill of that exper of experimentation. And it was Jeff Bezos who says, quite simply, if you double the number of experiments you do per year, you're going to double your inventiveness. Now, when I see that, I'm thinking to myself, surely that is saying experimentation equals innovation. And in many ways it does. Experimentation equals innovation. Because all innovation must involve numerous experiments, whether they're early stage in experiments, getting a little bit of qualitative feedback, or whether they're getting some kind of quantitative feedback in the form of a test before you go all in with your innovation. Remember, insights drive innovation. We gather those insights by questions, by observing, and by carrying out experiments. The fourth key skill is that of networking. Again, quite simply, what Christensen, Dyer, and Gregerson said is that it is noticeable that those people who are successful innovators have much deeper and wider networks than people who are less successful at innovation. And of course, that should be the case. Innovation is not a, um, it's not a, a solo sport. It's a team sport. It's a collaborative sport. You need lots and lots of people around you to, uh, to help and support you in your innovation efforts. So again, this is why I, I have such belief in the innovation network that, um, that you guys have developed here. It's a massive network. And inside that network is all the jewels that you'll need in terms of support organizations. Networking, so important. It's a famous African proverb that goes like, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go with others. And you guys are going to go far. You can only do it with others. Finally, is the skill of associating, combining and associating. There's many, many words for this. We can call it mixing and matching combination and thinking, association and thinking, we call it synthesis, we call it connecting the dots, we can call it recombination. So many other names have been associated with it, but there are a few things in innovation more powerful than associating. It was Steve Jobs who says, creativity is just connecting things. When you ask creative people how they did something, they feel a little guilty because they didn't really do it. They just saw something in one place and applied it in another. You're not cheating. That's innovation. 
look at what's happening in the public sector internationally. Look what's happening in, look at home in other public sector organizations. Look what's happening inside your own department in different silos. What can you see that you can grab and say, okay, we're gonna get that idea and we're gonna implement it within our own unique context. There's a huge amount to be said for looking sideways. And they are the skills. So to remind ourselves what differentiates successful innovators from less successful innovators, I'm sure everybody in this room wants to be a successful innovator. But ask better questions. Why, why not, what if? Observe with fresh eyes. Carry out experiments, basic qual or more sophisticated quants experiments. Network, network deeply and practice combination and association thinking. Looking sideways, there is so much amazing stuff already happening. You don't need to in reinvent the wheel. You just need to look at what is, where are the gems that will help our business to create more value my sector, my department, deliver more value for Ireland Inc. So that's about it, guys. That is a little bit on the innovator's brain. Thank you very that's much. That's brilliant, Fergal. Thank you so much. Really interesting. Um, and I think we'll have a few questions in about that towards the end. Um, so we're going we're gonna to hop on now to Grace. Um, so Grace leads their Del or leads their Deloitte Gov Lab, um, which is a proposition focused on public sector innovation. Um, she's worked with many organisations across the public service and has actually prepared the initial report for the Department of Public Expenditure, which ultimately then created this innovation network um, that we're attending today. So Grace has a particular interest in supporting organisations to develop the skills required for innovation, um, and I'm looking forward to Grace's presentation today. So. Um, Grace and, and Owen, whenever you're ready, and um, take it away. Thanks so much, Jade. Thanks for the invite. Um, lovely to be here today and definitely want to echo, echo Fergal's comments. Sad to see the, we call them the old team go, um, but great to see um, new people here with new energy and enthusiasm, you know, leading the public service innovation team and leading the network. So um, yeah, lovely to be here. I think Owen's going to drive the bus and share my slides. Yeah, I think it should be just loading now. Give me one moment. Great. Oh, perfect. Thanks a million. Owen, you might just go on to the next slide. Yeah, I think it's just loading my yes. end. So I suppose we tend to think of innovation and creativity as something that someone is either good at or not. Um, and that's definitely not the case. Innovation. Uh, is, is a skill we can learn um, and we can certainly develop the skills required for successful innovation by both learning in a formal setting or listening to talks like this, but also trying things out. Um, Fergal mentioned creativity a bit through his presentation and I wanted to start with a, a little exercise for everyone here today um, to kind of flex our creativity muscles or, and, and to warm up a little bit. So what I'd like you to do is to take your notebook um, and if you could, I don't know if you're able to move on there, Owen, or are we stuck on this screen? There you go. I think we've got a slide with um, 12 circles on it. So what I'd like you to do is grab your, your notebook and draw 12 circles on it. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it here with you guys as well. Sorry, Grace. So, Owen, I can't actually see a slide. I don't know if that's... Yeah, it doesn't seem to be moving on. If you want to uh, oh. present the rights to me, I can try share it and see. Yeah, yeah. no problem. Anyway, we'll keep going with yeah, our exercise. Go on, yeah. So, so take your notebook and, and 12 circles across the page. And what I want you to do is turn those circles into objects. OK, so I have some uh, sheets for you here. You can, might be able to see on my screen. I have a little uh, cat on the top right corner. I have a little smiley face and a little clock. So there's a few ideas. So I'm going to give you all 30 seconds to fill in as many circles as you can.
Let's see, 10 seconds left. I'll give you a few cheat seconds as well. Keep, keep filling in those circles, keep drawing objects. Okay, okay, we'll stop. Um, I'm guessing some of you found that quite hard and most people do. Suddenly you can't think of anything that's in the shape of a circle. Um, but it's interesting to practice this exercise and see how you can develop your, I suppose, your, your lateral thinking skills and your creativity skills. Um, I would encourage you to have 12 circles on your notebook when you're taking a break and see how many objects you can fill in and challenge yourself um, to come up with new ideas. And it's interesting over time how much better you get at generating ideas. I'm sure Fergal sees this all the time when he's teaching in, in UCD and elsewhere. Um, you know, when you start looking and observing the world around you, you realise how many objects are based on a circular shape. Um, if we were in a room together, I'd ask you to sh hold up your works of art. but. Um, Unfortunately, we're not, but I would encourage you to try this exercise. It's really simple. It's really easy, but it sort of gets you thinking and observing a little bit more uh, and develops your creativity. And these are key skills for innovation. So I might ask you, Jade, to move to the next slide. So what I wanted to talk about here was, I suppose, the way we traditionally solve problems. So we tend to, I suppose, approach problems in a very linear way. Uh, this is often how the public sector solve problems, and to be fair, how most people and organisations solve problems, not always, but a lot of the time. We, we identify a problem, we don't necessarily discuss it with anyone from outside the organisation or with the people that this problem impacts. And you sort of make an assumption that you know what the problem is. Or if you go then and, and get yourself into a room with maybe yourself or a few other people, uh, and come up with a solution to that problem without, again, necessarily consulting with anyone, you know, head down, figuring out the problem, coming up with a solution. Uh, and then the next step is to go on and implement the solution without necessarily trying it or understanding if it works. I'm sure we've all often heard of systems being implemented without asking the user, the end user, what they actually think of it. Uh, and then we make an assumption that the problem is solved. Um, and that's not often the case, and, and this can often lead to unsuccessful solutions, this very linear way. And built into this approach is a lot of assumptions. So we assume we know what the problem is. We assume we know what the best solution is, and we assume we know what the user needs. Instead, I'm going to um, we, we might move to the next slide, Jade, and I'm going to talk to you about innovation by design. And this is a different approach or a different way of solving problems. And it's often called user-centered design or hum human-centered design. Uh, and just like the previous, um, I suppose, approach or flow, there's four phases here, but they're quite different to what we saw on the previous slide. Look and listen is the first stage, and this is about observing the environment around you, understanding the person that the challenge or the problem impacts. Asking questions, conducting research, being curious, being nosy, gathering data. And I really like Fergal's point, uh, you know, the Einstein quote, but if you had 100 minutes or 60 minutes to solve a problem, you'd spend 55 understanding it. And actually, that's what you, you'd spend the majority of your time on this first green, um, I suppose, stage to really understand what is going on. The next stage is solve, and this is where ideation occurs, and this is a really important skill for innovation, and, and that this is the solution phase. So this is where you come up with multiple solutions based on what you've learned in the look and listen phase, uh, and you decide, you know, you come up with many, many options, and then you decide what you're going to prototype. Uh, and what's key here is this is not linear, this is iterative. So while you're in the solve, phase, you might move back to the look and listen phase to, to sort of probe a little bit more with the user to understand a little bit more about the problem. Next is prototyping, a really important skill for innovation. And this is about building a proof of concept and asking your users to trial your solution. Experimentation is a, a key skill here. 
uh, and collaboration to working with others to come up with a workable prototype. Sometimes it can be a physical solution. It could be maybe a map up of a digital solution on a phone, or sometimes it can just be a series of imaging images portraying the solution, but you're trying to give the user, the end user, um, a sense of what the solution will be like so that they can react to it and give you feedback. And then the last stage is build and launch. So here you would pilot your solution. You would have learned a lot from your prototyping uh, stage and you would go ahead and scale up. Some of the key points I'd just like to raise here, I suppose, is uh, and what's different to the previous linear approach. So important to be able to understand people's behavior, observe what's going on, observe what's happening, listen to what people are saying, uh, and be really open-minded about, about what the problem might be and not make assumptions or not assume you, you understand the problem. This approach is based on sprint-based working. Um, you would work in a series of small sprints, you wouldn't move ahead too far with any solution before pausing and reflecting and being really agile about how you work. So you don't waste a lot of time building something to realize that it doesn't work. And then we already talked about the skills of prototyping and piloting. And then the final one is iteration, not being able, not being, I suppose, afraid to step back uh, and go backwards a step and go forwards a step as opposed to feeling like you always have to move forward. So that's a very brief introduction to in innovation by design or user-centered design, but key is having the user, the public, the citizen at the center of the solution that you're developing and understand their needs. On the next slide, I talk a little bit about mindset, skill set, and toolkit. And I suppose we are talking about skills here, but it's really important to think about the mindset you need for innovation and also what you need in your tool bag to do innovation. And mindset is the way we think about things. We can have a fixed or a growth mindset. Um, fixed mindset usually indicates a belief that, you know, it's hard to change, it's hard to improve or learn or get better. But a growth mindset is the opposite. Um, and actually for innovation, that growth mindset and that optimism is so important. Um, and it's important in particular, I'm going to talk in a minute about um, leadership for innovation, but it's really important for leaders to adopt and an innovation mindset. Skill set are the competencies that Fergus spoke about and that I've already alluded to, um, engaging with end users, prototyping, observation. And then the toolkit is, is what we have in our kit bag. So methods for engaging with the public. The 12 circles exercise, that's part of your toolkit. That's helping to develop your creativity and your skills. Uh, and the innovation by design approach as well would be something that you would have in your toolkit. So. I suppose it's it's having the mindset and the toolkit along with the, the tool set along with the skill set. I'm, I'm mixing up my words. Um, Jade, we might look at the next slide. Um, I suppose it's thinking about, uh, I suppose I've divided the, the, the sort of skills needed by where you might sit in an organization. I'm sure there's lots of you here who are leaders and managers or, or part of a team and I'm calling uh, those who are part of a team, practitioners. Uh, I suppose you need slightly different skill sets depending on where you sit in an, organi in an organization. Mindset is really important for leaders. It's really important that they're visionary, that they understand the innovation imperative um, and understand how you can innovate in a way that aligns with your strategic priorities. Horizon scanning is a skill that's been um, talked about a lot recently. It's really about understanding trends, developments, threats, opportunities, and, and knowing what's going on in the wider world. Um, and risk taking is a really important skill for leaders. And we're going to talk about that in a few minutes a little bit more. Managers tend to have the skill set for innovation and, and understand how to do innovation. Um, I suppose they need to be critical thinkers. Um, and really people centred, understanding that you need to put people at the centre of innovation. And also really collaborative, you know, you build better, stronger skills for innovation and better solutions when you work with others and, and work with people that you might not usually work with or expect to work with. And then practitioners of innovation would have skills in design sprint facilitation. They would understand how to use innovation by design. 
they would be data literate, and I don't mean just big spreadsheets, but understand how to use the insights you gain from the users and would have built up creative confidence. So they would be confident in their skills, in their innovation skills. The next uh, two slides, I think the next one in particular is, is really interesting. I know I'm coming up on time. Um, it, this is from the OECD. Um, and, and they set out, I suppose, a beta model a couple of years ago on the six score skills required for innovation. So it's worth looking at. There's lots in common about what we spoke already, iteration, user centricity. I just call out two that I really like. Uh, insurgency is one, so that's questioning the status quo, not being afraid to disrupt, not being afraid to challenge, not being afraid to speak out if you think there's a better way. And then the other one I really like is storytelling. It's a great skill for innovation, being able to sell your idea to the user, being able to explain what you're trying to achieve. Uh, and then the next slide, Jade, has a few more examples. I can share the links to these documents. The Estonian government has developed an innovation competency framework, as has the Australian government. So they've got a quite nice guide on developing innovation skills. And I suppose they're all on a similar theme with variations. So I just want to leave you with one thought today, and we might move to the to the last slide. And I'm sure this slide strikes fear into many people here in this audience, um, particularly in the public sector. Failure is not good. Um, failure is bad. You know, you're under a lot of scrutiny and you can't be seen to be wasteful in any way. But I would encourage you all to try things out on a small scale and be comfortable with small failures and get used to the idea that everything you try doesn't work. Um, for those of you who are leaders or managers, try and think about how you might communicate with your teams about failure and how you might create a space to try things out and maybe not demonize the word as much as we often do. Uh, we can learn a lot from failure and we can become more resilient. So, so there are my thoughts on the skills for innovation for today. Um, I hope you've learned something from it. Um, and I really appreciate the opportunity to, to speak with you guys today. Thank you. Thanks a lot for that, Grace. And sorry about the technical difficulty there, but I think we, we got there in the end. Yeah, Thank no, you. all good, all good. Thank you. That was, that was brilliant and um, really good presentation. Um, and ne next up then we have, um, Owen, have you sorted out there? Yeah, Julianne's asking for there. Okay, um, so Julianne, if you want to start getting your presentation ready, um, next we have yeah, Julianne Coughlin, who is a service design manager with Cork County Council. Um, so Julianne has a what I believe is a very exciting role down in Cork um, and one that's very relevant to today's session. So she is an innovator, that's what she does every day. Um, and as service design manager, um, she gets to innovate and use innovative um, frameworks and methodologies in her um, in her daily job. So, uh, Julianne, if you want to take it away then and, and tell us what, what you're doing down in Cork, we'd really appreciate it. Great. Thanks a million, Jade. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah? Yep. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, thanks a million for having me here today. I'm going to share the experience of innovating in Cork County Council through my team. Um, the unit is called Service Republic, and we're a dedicated service design unit in Cork County Council. I'm going to talk a bit about the skills that have worked for us over the last few years. Um, and I, I put the dead badger in because I thought that might pique your interest a little bit, but I, I will I will come to the dead badger shortly. <laughs> so um, I guess we've had a lot of success in digital innovation through the team um, in the council, and we've very successfully used service design as well and design thinking to deliver transformation in different areas. And I, I kind of feel we really have the ingredients in our organisations to make real change happen. Um, and that's not just Cork County Council, but like everywhere in different organisations, those skills exist. So I'm going to talk a little bit about my experience. And when I was thinking about what would the skills be that I'd look for if I was recruiting into my team now, to be honest, I think I'd trade skills for attitude any day of the week. Um, skills can be learned, but it's difficult to change attitude and to, to have people with the right attitude in your team at the, at the beginning is really important. And I've been so lucky with my team. They've had such enthusiasm and optimism over the years about their work. Um, and I've, I've experienced that not just in my own team. I think in the organization overall, we've met some really incredible staff who've been very impressive and, and wonderful stakeholders outside the organization who've been keen to you know, work with us too. So I think um, attitude is just equally important as skills. Okay. 
So I'm going to just put all this up. This is the Dead Badger one. I know you're all dying to see this one. Um, so back in 2016, we implemented a new online services platform because we knew, and we also knew we had to redesign services as we were digitizing. And it was clear too that the previous kind of Lean Six Sigma methods and um, things we tried before BPIs, they were very inward focused and uh, the kind of IT business analysis approach we were using at the time as well was, wasn't really rapid or agile. I know that agility was mentioned there by Grace as well, very important. So we knew we needed a different approach to redesigning services. And at the event for our new online platform, um, Snook gave a presentation and Snook were a design agency in the UK. And they presented about hearing your customers and taking a user centered approach to uh, designing your services. And they led with this dead badger story. <laughs> and basically, it was this poor woman somewhere in the UK who was so frustrated with trying to contact the council and figure out how she could dispose with, of this dead badger on her property that in the end she rocked up to a front counter there and landed the dead badger across the desk to staff in the council. So the moral of the story, I suppose, was that before people get to that level of frustration, we have to kind of understand the difficulty they can have access in our services and that if we design services with them, so this co-design approach and bring them into the process, we can hopefully avoid the dead badger situation in that instance. So that really kind of was like a eureka moment for us that service design was something we could we could try. So we adopted the service design approach to transforming our services in conjunction with digitization. And um, over the years, I suppose we've moved beyond services to looking at design in terms of the service context. So working with key stakeholders and using a design thinking approach to, um, you know, defining problems and, and framework, frame, framing problems with them. Um, and then we've moved even past that to recently um, we used a design thinking approach to develop our corporate plan. And that really had a transformational effect, I think, in, across our council. Um, staff were so delighted that they were being brought into the discussion with us and invited in to talk about the plan and how it would work. Um, that I really felt there was a kind of cultural shift starting to happen in the organisation. You could see people getting engaged, getting involved. It was brilliant. And then suddenly we had COVID at the start of 2020. So our focus then dramatically shifted again to, you know, scaling up and expanding out our, our online services really quickly. And we were very lucky we were able to do that. We delivered 111 services um, online just in 2020 alone. And I think, to be honest, some of the reason we were so successful was the team that I that I have, the Service Republic unit, like we have a very unique set of skills in the team and they work really well together. So it's kind of almost like um, what Fergal was talking about, the innovation brain, kind of have the innovation brain, uh, complete innovation brain between us. Um, I'm sure there's there's a public sector joke in there somewhere, but um, they, you know, we have the, the empathy and user-centered focus through our strategic design and innovation and design thinking approach. And I suppose we actually have our technical platform then to deliver the design services. So it's important that we're able to actually deliver something at the end of that process as well. And, and very importantly, then, I guess we have, you know, the means to understand what the data in the service is telling us. So again, both the quantitative data through kind of the BI and analytics side of things, and then combining that with the qualitative um, approach to um, using user engagement and, and you know, research with stakeholders. All of that together is really powerful because the data is telling us a lot about the experience of our services. So having all these things together is really important. So I suppose combine, combining key skills is very, very important for innovation. There's no Liam Neeson lads for innovation. Nobody has all of the unique skills that are needed, but a kind of a combination of the right skills is, is equally magic when it happens. Uh, so if I was kind of writing a spec, I guess, for people that I'd like to recruit to my team, I'd be, I'd be thinking of them in these kind of terms. And again, I, what kind of struck me listening to Fargo was there's kind of a combination of the left and right side um, uh, brain capacity here in, in these descriptions. So technology enthusiasts, people who don't necessarily know the nuts and bolts of technology, but they really do understand its potential and they you know they're enthusiastic about what it can do. Um, problem collectors, people who will go out there and just pester people for quest questions about what's wrong, nosy people, um, you know, getting to the root cause of things. And then solution artists, so people who are creative about how we can approach a solution to something after they've asked all those questions and gathered all that insight. Um, data whisperers, so 
those who want to kind of run away from an Excel spreadsheet or all other sources of data that are out there and can kind of, you know, really connect with that data and understand what it's telling us about the services and then service influencers. So people who will, you know, go out there and advocate for changes in how we're doing our work and not be afraid to influence others in trying something different and working in a new way. I think that's that's how I'd like to think of the people that, that I like to that I that I think work well in my team. So um, apart from the team itself, I guess knowing where you want to go with whatever innovation you're working towards is important. You need to do your research, have your vision. And, and really inform that with an understanding of what it is you want to do, a bit of research to, to begin with. So we did a lot of that before we ever formed our team and ever embarked on our design and digitization uh, program. So that's really important. There was a bit of a mismatch we found in our research between what staff felt about our capability as an organization and what the public um, found. So it's just interesting the kind of insights like that that you can, you can discover when you, when you do that research in advance and build your vision. And then I suppose start with the know your strengths, start with what's strong and not with what's wrong, which is a quote that I really like to, to re remember every now and then. You never know what someone can bring to the table until you ask, kind of look beyond your traditional structures and hierarchies. We've got to try to do that more in the public sector. We're really, really constrained a lot of the time in, you know, oh, we're reporting to this person, so we must work this way or we can't ask a question somewhere else. We've got to move away from that. Share, communicate and try to be brave about what you're doing. And um, being successful, I suppose, aside from having the skills, it will be determined by how we change and transform ourselves too, because you have to understand the transformation happens within yourself as well as you're going on this, this journey. Also, be able to recognize that you've been innovate, that something transformative and innovative is happening and, and connecting those things together is very important in your organization, connecting it so you can scale it out and build it up. So we kind of need to create a movement in our organizations for innovation and um, building relationships as well and empathy as part of how we work is just vital so that, you know, helping other people to get the job done or to work in a different way is sometimes as important as what we're actually trying to do ourselves. Um, yeah, so creating innovation habitats, I kind of like the idea that maybe, you know, we're trying to bring essentially build up the numbers of imagine what is an endangered species in the public sector. And by creating an innovation habitat, you know, you, you give the chance for this sort of thing to flourish. And we have to look within our own organizations, obviously, for that and then outside as well, because we can't do this in isolation. The people outside our organizations, our stakeholders are just as important to bring into that whole process. Um, and then I guess find the trigger, like where do you start? So you have your vision, you have some skills that will help you achieve that. So then find the thing that will sow the seed for innovation to, to grow. Um, it might be digitization, it kind of was for us, but it could be like a new customer service model or maybe um, creating a new welcome space for the public in one of your buildings, or it could be even something as, as silly as bring a pet to work day. Like you just kind of never know what's going to be the trigger for something more. So um, be open to, to finding that and, and recognizing it when it comes. Some of the key takeaways, sure, I had to get the lads onto a slide somehow. So, um, sorry, I go back to it. Um, yeah, so I think innovation is a bit like the Olympics. Um, so you kind of don't, you don't, um, this is going to keep changing, I'd say, but anyway, you don't send a rowing team to compete in the basketball. Know your strengths, right? That's really important. Um, and, and the people can, competing at the forefront as well are supported by, I suppose, a whole team of other people. So you need to have support behind you and you need to, to build that capacity around the, the innovation kind of focus, if you like, in your organization. Um, some investment is needed, whether it's time or space or, or capacity and the vision is very important. The reward, of course, is, is really great when all those things come, come together. Once you have your vision, then think about the skills and the combination of skills needed to achieve this and build the capacity in different ways. Like be a bit creative about how you can build out your capacity um, for innovation. Recruiting the right people with the right attitude to, uh, is so important to the innovation cause. And um, break down barriers as well between whoever your team is that, that's doing the innovation and the people involved, say, in the service or the activity that you're actually trying to, to transform. And that's, I think, why design works really well, because, you you know, that engagement and co-design process can just yield some very powerful results. Obviously, then, innovation is for everybody, so there's no point in hoarding it. I'll, I'll flick this up here again for a second. You need to share it, communicate it, um, and it'll grow. 
And um, there's no perfect innovation skill set, really, I don't think, but there's a few killer combos that can have a real impact depending on what you're trying to do. So you need to find out what delivers for you and then kind of mix it up. And hopefully by doing it, all of that, um, none of us will have to face a dead badger on our, our, on our public counters anywhere. So um, that's really all I was going to say. So thank you very much, everybody. Really appreciate it. And hopefully talk to some of you again. That was brilliant, Julianne. Thanks a lot for sharing that. Um, and mm -hmm. I've, actually had, I've had a couple of messages from people asking, are these slides going to be available? Um, so yes, we will share the slides um, on our website. And then also remember that the session is being recorded, which we will share also. Um, so you'll be able to watch back um, when we put it on our website and we'll let you know when, when it's available. So last but by no means least, um, we have Mary Trace Power. So Mary Trace heads up the project management office in the Department of Foreign Affairs um, and has had the specific responsibility for developing and embedding the innovation uh, capability and capacity of the department over the last number of years. Um, so Mary Trace is actually finishing up in her role shortly and is moving on to the climate unit within the department, um, but she will be passing the innovative torch on, I hope. Um, and she's here today to kind of share her thoughts over the last couple of years in the department. Um, and just to say as well that when Mary Trace finishes, um, if people want to stay, there will be a question and answer session. I know that we're, we're kind of eating into lunch, but there will be a short um, question and answer session with the panel. And um, so Mary Trace, I'll, I'll hand over to you now. That's the stage. Thanks a million, Jade. Um, and thanks everyone. It's, it's a real pleasure to be here today. Um, as Jade mentioned, I, I am handing over the innovation torch in a couple of weeks. So it's, it's good timing to, uh, to step back and reflect on the experience and some of the skills I suppose that I've gained and used over the last four years as the project manager for the DFA Innovation Initiative. Um, I'm also grinning quite a lot um, at the, I suppose, the overlap between some of the experience of the others or some of the, the skills that the others have, have mentioned. Um, I'm feeling quite proud that there's quite a few of them that, uh, that we have, we've learned or we've, we've delivered uh, within DFA over the last few years. Um, just at the outset, I, I would say, because for me, this was a real challenge to get over initially, was this idea that innovation is this sort of obscure or kind of intangible concept that is really the preserve of, you know, the, the, the Twitters or the Instagrams or whatever of this world. Um, and then you look around and you see the examples that the team here share in their newsletter, um, the ideas that have been funded under the Public Service Innovation Fund and the Civil Service Excellence Innovation Awards. Um, and I think there's just so many amazing examples of, of innovation within the civil service, and I think we should all be reassured and, and really proud of, of that fact. Um, and so I suppose my reflection on that is that while big ideas are really important and, and blue sky thinking is absolutely essential, um, my experience over the last four years has been that there's some really practical skills, I suppose, that, uh, that support innovation um, or su support successful innovation. Um, so Jade, you might just give me a nod to confirm that you can see the, the presentation, perfect. Um, so, as I said, I was the, the project manager for the DFA Innovation Initiative, or I still am for a couple more weeks. Um, and our objective was to both um, support a, an increase in the kind of innovation um, atmosphere or, or agenda within the department, but also to support um, individual ideas, individual innovation ideas, uh, and turn them from ideas to reality, as it were. Um, what have I learned over that period? Well, the first thing for me was to, to pay attention. Um, and for me, that means, you know, listening, understanding connections between things and, and maybe asking some, some, some important questions, as Virgil said. Um, so in DFA, while we have, you know, loads of examples of, of innovation across our mission network, we've won a couple of innovation, civil service innovation awards, um, and the, the passport office similarly have, have won a couple of innovation awards um, in the kind of more private sector. Um, we still had a very poor score on the civil service employee engagement survey in relation to an invasion climate. So clearly there was some sort of problem there. Um, and so that's where we kind of started in, in our questioning and in looking at uh, what was wrong. Um, the next step then is to think it out. Um, and these are, you know, uh, the really straightforward things of, of just asking questions, challenging assumptions and talking to everybody and anybody that you can. Um, for me, that was about, I suppose, trying to understand maybe some barriers that 
that weren't apparent to me, but clearly were barriers for some members of the department in terms of engaging with innovation or feeling like their voice was was going to be heard if they came forward with an idea. And um, in terms of communication or reaching out to people, uh, we spoke to, to lots of people and I can't recommend speaking to, to experts like Fergal uh, enough. It was really valuable to get a sense from, from someone like him um, how, an, how a department kind of can progress on this innovation journey. And then also to speak to other departments or public, public bodies uh, to understand what they had done in the innovation space. So the lessons that they learned were some of the things that worked really well for them. The next step then, and this isn't so much of a skill as more of a, a suspending, I suppose, your desire, or maybe it's the, the, the departments or the organization's desire to be perfect or to have things perfect. At some point, you really just need to try something and um, give it a go and, and I suppose hope for the best to an extent. Um, so within DFA, we delivered a number of innovation initiatives. Um, we set up an ideas bank, which is a centralized portal where all staff could submit ideas um, for consideration and possible progression. Um, we had a number of innovation events, which were around kind of building awareness of innovation, demystifying it, I suppose, to an extent, and building capacity within the organization, building people's understanding of, of what innovation was and what the value it could or what value it could bring to the organization. Um, we also had an innovation award ceremony where we had uh, a number of categories of innovation initiatives that had been delivered um, and shortlisted those for awards by the Secretary General. And then lastly, we had the, the first ever DFA um, IV Innovation Fund, which was an internal innovation fund with a budget of 50,000 euros to support the delivery of, of innovation ideas within the department. All of those initiatives, um, they actually went very, very well for the most part. Um, much better, I think, than I than I could have hoped for in, in many cases. But I would say none of them were flawless. And that brings me on to my next point, which is the ability to reflect. Um, and I think, to be honest, part of this is the sort of humility or the confidence to look honestly at areas that didn't work very well and to adapt and to, I suppose, capture that inf information and, and, and bring it back into your planning for the next phase. Um, I think, you know, listening to feedback, asking for feedback in the first instance um, and just being honest about your mistakes um, or areas that you could have done better is, is just so important at this stage. What I would say in terms of the uh, innovation project within DFA, um, we delivered it as a rolling annual um, project. So that provided a structure in which the, the processes that I've just mentioned worked quite well. So we had an annual um, we had an annual, I suppose, process around which we identified the challenges, the, the issues we wanted to address and the objectives of the project. Then we developed a plan to implement uh, solutions. And then we had a, a structured process at the end where we would capture lessons and, and, and incorporate that back into our planning for the year ahead. Um, this worked really, really well in DFA. It may not work as well for, for every organization, but for me, you know, when you might not have the the perfect dream team for innovation or you yourself might not have all of those skills um the project management structure i think just provided a framework in which um the next step was always kind of evident or or obvious um and you can just work within that it also and this is a very important point from the from the dfa perspective it provided a very clear progression structure for any of the ideas that were submitted to the ideas bank or to the innovation team so that people who did submit ideas felt confident in, in submitting those ideas to us because they understood how the idea would be evaluated and how it might be progressed. Um, so I think that was a useful piece in terms of in terms of just clarity um, and and yeah, I suppose trust in the system for DFA staff. Um, so that's that's that for me is the kind of the key things. Um, as I said, while innovation absolutely needs ideas and, and blue sky thinking, there are a lot of very practical skills that I think um, can are, will are absolutely essential in I suppose delivering successful innovation. So uh, yeah, listening, paying attention, challenging assumptions, uh, effective planning, and and reflection and feedback are really important. And I think maybe one that hasn't been mentioned uh, so far is definitely patience as well. Things don't always go right on, 
on the first attempt, um, nor do you always have the perfect audience for innovation, but um, you just have to, to keep working. Um, and I think structures like the, the Public Service Innovation Network are just so brilliant in, I suppose, providing that bit of reassurance that, that you're not the only one working in this space and there's lots of other um, public bodies and, and departments that are kind of working along the same journey and uh, there's lots of lessons and, and that to be learned from one another. So, um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll finish on that. Happy to answer any questions and, uh, yeah, just thanks again for, for having me today. Brilliant. Thanks a lot, Mary Trace. That was that was excellent. Um, and I think what you mentioned there about the importance of reflection is so important. And it kind of links to what Grace said about kind of being honest about your failures. And, you know, failure is good sometimes. Um, you know, we need to acknowledge that. And then it, then it got me thinking about what Julianne said about, um, you know, attitude can be more important than skills. And sometimes you have to have an attitude of dusting yourself off when you make a mistake or when you fail at a project. And, and carrying on so um yeah my, my brain is racing now after all those presentations um and i guess i guess we'll open the we'll open the floor now to any any questions so if you have any questions for for um mary trace uh julia and grace and fergal please do share them in the, the chat function we can we can stay for another couple of minutes and ask any questions um i actually i have a question for fergal that i'd i'd love to ask um i'm going to put them on the spot now and i'm, I'm going to ask them to um you know, you mentioned five skills and I imagine that you kind of give them equal importance, but if I had to get you to pick one of the skills as the most important one, what would, what would it be? Hey, Jay, that's a great question. Um, look, at I love all the skills. We practice them all the time with learners. Um, people are amazed when they practice these skills, how quickly they improve on them. That's a very important point to make. It is like riding a bike, you know, I mean, we're all creative people. It's just that somewhere along the way, a lot of us stop practicing our creativity. But to answer your question, which one in particular, I would have to plumb for association. Because for me, I met a fantastic new uh, senior manager in ESP recently, and he said to his team, I don't want you coming to me with brand new breakthrough ideas. I want you to come to me with ideas that have been successful in other utilities, either abroad or here in Ireland, where you can point to success and to say, this is what we should be doing in the ESB in Electric Ireland. And I thought to myself, so that's just so sensible. Like, what is the chance that Electric Ireland are going to come up with a disruptive innovation in a space where the whole world is trying to find products and services? And instead, find, look sideways at other utilities or other service organizations, either here or abroad, find ideas that work, figure out what needs to be done, what needs to be adapted and revised to make them work in your own organization. So association for me, uh, Jade, I think. Okay, brilliant. Um, we have another question in, and I think I'm going to put this to Mary Trays and Julianne. Um, so, do you have any top tips on how to make the case to senior management for initially investing um, your time to illustrate the benefits of a user-centered service design approach? So I don't know, Julianne, if you want to take that one first. Sure, yeah. Um, yeah, that's, I suppose that's the thing that lots of people are, have, have asked me over the while, you know, how did you manage to get this up and running and how did you get people at the top on board? Um, I suppose we were in a very lucky situation in that our then, um, our head of IT uh, became the divisional manager slash deputy chief executive in the council. And really being, I suppose, looking beyond the IT function and seeing the business and what could be achieved, like he kind of immediately understood what service design could bring to the organization. I mean, what I would say, the reason we, we, I suppose, after a short period of time, we rolled out a couple of successful projects quickly, nothing kind of earth shattering, but we kind of got the, the word out that this was a new way of doing things. And because you're engaging people and because you're co-designing with them, I think, um, you know, people, People kind of gossip about what works well and what hasn't worked well. And people who'd never been asked questions about how we might improve something for them were suddenly being asked to do that. 
or people were meeting their, their customers and they've never done that. So that really created a kind of an excitement around um, doing something different. So what I would suggest is do something small, do something you know you can you can win with. I know the quick wins thing is hackneyed, but honest to God, it really does work. And it's important when you're trying something new. If you're going to experiment, experiment, like give yourself a kind of a good chance of succeeding with it, whatever you're going to experiment with. And that then in itself can create a little momentum around what you're trying to do. I think that's, that's my two cents. And then Mary Trez, um, from your perspective then, I guess, did you have to make the case to senior management um, to even the innovation fund, for example, you, you spoke about that. Was that an idea that you brought to senior management um, to look for their approval or do you want to speak a bit about that? Yeah, um, so just, just in response to the question, um, a couple of things spring to mind. So firstly, um, I think Fergal's point about you don't always have to reinvent the wheel and, and pointing to examples of success elsewhere is a really good way of showing senior management that um, this has worked elsewhere. You're not actually taking that significant a risk here because there's there's evidence to suggest it works. Um, in, yeah, in, in response to your question around the innovation fund, so there's an aspect of patience, there's an aspect of perseverance, and then there's also an aspect of just giving it a go. And I never expected that the CFO would say yes when I asked him for 50,000 euros to run the innovation fund. I thought he was going to laugh me out of the room. Um, so you just have to ask sometimes. And you will be surprised, definitely, you know, there's some senior managers out there that might not um, really kind of have, have jumped on board the innovation agenda, but there are others out there that, that might you know, might surprise you and they, they really are very supportive. So it's a case of just, I think, um, talking to as many people as you can and, and trying to find who your, uh, who your advocates may be. But I would say that senior management buy-in is, is so very important. Um, and for me, we've had just great support from, from our CFO um, and, and, our, and our Secretary General as well, which is brilliant. And, and the last thing I would say on that point is, I also just use the, the public service agenda and, and the Ops 2030 is now a really good tool for anyone that is kind of struggling with conveying the meaning of innovation or the value of innovation. There's no question, it's a real priority for the civil and public service. So you have to do something in the space or we really do need to do something in the space. So that's a very good, uh, I suppose, yeah, um, asset to have in your pocket when trying to make the case for an innovation initiative. Jade, can I quickly yeah. ask Mary Trace, does your, does your DFA Innovation Fund operate more or less along the same lines as the Public Sector Innovation Fund? Yes, yeah. That's brilliant. I, yeah, it was, it was a huge success, I have to say. I was really, really delighted. So a couple of very quick deliveries um, and they were working on the kind of three other projects that, that are yet to be delivered, whether well, they're, they're in kind of planning at the moment. Um, so. Yeah, couldn't couldn't believe uh, what a success it was. And and if anyone is on the call and is interested, um, feel free to reach out to Jade or the team to get my contact details and uh, and give the call. See, yeah, Jade, I Jade, just to say, um, see, this is what I I completely agree with what Julianne said earlier on about attitude trump skills, right? Um, and, you know, it's no coincidence for me to see the level of energy that Mary Trace and Julianne have, right? I mean, they are persuasive people. If you go to your boss looking for 50 grand, how are you going to, how would you say no to her? Because you know she's going to be coming back knocking on that door time and time and time again. And I, it, it, attitude, it's a lot about passion and energy and attitude in innovation. Yeah, 100%. Um, and I actually, I would really love, and I, I think our network would really love to know more about some of the projects that actually were kind of successful in your, your internal innovation fund. So we might get, I don't know if we can get you back on to talk about that. We might invite some of the um, successful projects to come back and, and share how they got on. And um, really great to hear about that. Um, and then the last question I have, and it kind of links in um, and it's for Grace. And it's kind of in relation to the, the senior management team or the senior leadership um, team in an organisation. How you, you put up that slide of kind of the three different um, categories. And I'm just wondering, what would your advice be to, to leaders to support practitioners um, in being innovative and developing an innovative capacity? What, what can leaders do to support the innovative practitioners? I suppose, Jay, the first word that comes to my mind is permission, to give permission. Um, it, it's like what, you know, 
Mary Claire, are my trades going and looking for the 50,000? And getting that is giving permission to do something differently and creating a space where people can have a little bit of time to try something. Um, I, I suppose, look, communication is so important. Talking about innovation signals to the organisation that it's important, that it's a priority for the organisation. So, so for leaders to communicate about innovation is absolutely um, critical, but I think that sort of leads to permission. Um, and if there's any way they can, leaders can allow, you know, teams to have a little bit of time, a little bit of money, uh, money might maybe not always available, or a little bit of a space to try something out, that can be transformative. Um, so I suppose that's that's what I would advise in terms of leadership. You know, talk about it, explain that it's a priority for the organisation, and allow people to try something small. Uh, and it's amazing then what sort of entrepreneurs emerge when when actually they realise, oh, I can actually do something, I can try something. Uh, and I'm sure you've all seen that in your organisations. Yeah. Um, I actually have w one more question in, um, and I'm actually going to put it to to all of you. Um, it's kind of in relation to, to failure, that, that dirty word that we were talking about earlier. Um, and the question is, how can I help other members of my team deal with failure? Um, you know, some people see it as a learning exercise and leave our lessons learned and we'll use our, our failures as experience to, to move on. But others still view failure as quite negative. Um, so I, I'd like to just close off and, and hear your thoughts on, on failure. Um, and, and how we can change the perception of it in, in innovation and in the public service. So, Fergal, can I go to you first? Yeah, of course. I was, I always remember a conversation I had with the head of people at Google a number of years ago, and I asked her this very question. And she said to me that every Friday morning, the two founders of Google, Sergey Brin and, and his friend, they host a, a kind of conference call for the whole staff. They can all come in and ask questions and they give a quick update on what's happened during the week. And they constantly talk about their own failures. They say, we had to scrap this uh, project. It cost us 3 million euros, but we pulled the plug on it this week. Uh, it was a pet, a pet project of mine. I was really committed to it. You know, probably spent a little bit more on it than we should have, you know, but they're constantly telling everybody their own mistakes and showing your own vulnerabilities. And to me, that's how you do it. You gotta, you gotta walk the talk. If you want people to accept failure, you've gotta be able to show that you're, you're because of your creativity, you're also uh, going to fail. So for me, that's the key is, is the show. Okay, brilliant. And Grace, can I, can I move to you next? I know we've had a conversation before about, you know, creating the psychological safety in the workplace and kind of providing staff an opportunity to fail and, and make mistakes and learn from them. So I'd love to get your thoughts on, on failure and how to support teams. You're absolutely right, Jane. Psychological safety is sort of, is a part, such an important part of psychological safety is not having a blame culture. Um, and I think in, in, in most organisations and particularly in, in the public sector, there, t there can be that blame culture or there can be that culture where you feel like you can't admit if you haven't gotten something right. Uh, and I think creating that safe space, uh, actually, when you asked the question first, I wrote down failure session, which is quite similar to what Fergus spoke about, but creating that space to be able to say, lad, I screwed up, I got something wrong, but actually, this is what I learned from it. Um, and maybe talking about it at a team meeting or even having a separate session and you sort of, you don't want to overemphasize our I failure either. And uh, you want to take, you know, learnings from it, but it builds resilience to be able to talk about and accept failure. So having that psychological safe, psychologically safe space to talk about it is really important. And it doesn't come overnight, just like trust doesn't come overnight. It's, it, it's something that needs to be worked on over time for sure. Um, but but definitely not seeing failure as a problem or not being able to admit when something went wrong is a problem is, is really important. Yeah, um, and Mary Trace, do you want to touch on on failure and if you've any kind of tips for for dealing with failure in a team? Um, yeah, what I would say is I 100% agree with with Grace and Virgil. I think it's important to be able to talk about it um, and and to put it out there and and that makes other people feel more comfortable 
um, possibly failing or talking about failure. That said, you know, no one really loves failing. Like no one loves when you absolutely mess something up. So I suppose you need to acknowledge that it's always going to be uncomfortable. It's just being able to be that little bit uncomfortable and and talk about it, um, and not kind of hide things or or you know not risk anything. Um, so yeah, I suppose learning to be slightly uncomfortable in in the failure space is probably important as well. Yeah, um, and and Julianne, can I give you the the closing line on on failure? The last word. Innovation. <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I was just thinking as you were talking there, oh my God, what am I going to say that's different to what everyone else just said? But actually, no, the reality is, I think, um, maybe the language we use around that, it, it could could be different as well, you know, um, talking about failure, like it's really kind of unintended results or things that happened, that unexpected things that happened. And maybe um, we need to kind of rephrase the idea around what, what's failing. It might be that something unexpected happened and, and drill into it a little. Like we all talk about lessons learned, but look, we don't do enough of that ourselves. I know from my from my own team's point of view, go back and really look at things didn't work out the way we thought and why is that? But what happened? And what is it that's maybe good that could come out of that? Or what did that lead on to? Did that lead on to something else? I don't think we kind of drill into it enough as a, as a thing. Um, and just maybe changing our our way of framing the idea of failure, it's just, that would help, I think, certainly, if we had a, an approach like that to it um, a little. So something we all have to work on, I think, to be fair. Yeah. Yeah, a huge task for us there to change the change the narrative around failure. But I, I think you're right. It's reframing it. And it goes back then to your point about an attitude. We all need to just have a different attitude to these unintended consequences that that may arise when we're, we're working on innovative um, projects or, or anything really. Um, that was, yeah, brilliant. There's a lot to take away from that now. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm just gonna wrap it up now. Um, so I'd like to thank you all for, for taking part today. So thank you to Fergal, Grace, uh, Julianne and Mary Trace for presenting um, brilliant presentations. And I will definitely be going back to watch this recording um, a couple of times <laughs> to get all of those nuggets um, to get to listen back to hear what you said again. Um, and thank you everyone for attending and for staying a little bit later than, than planned. Um, I, I really appreciate it. And yeah, so thanks for me and all the team for, for joining this uh, network session and save the date for the next one. It will be October the 6th and we'll be sending out more information on that. And don't forget, you can catch this recording um, on our website and we will also send everybody who attended information for that too. So yeah, thanks for that everybody. Really enjoyed it. Talk to you soon. Thanks for that. Bye. Bye-bye.